Cheers. Um, this little vid is inspired by Mr. Trip Fuller over at Homebrew Christianity. He had sent me an email and said, hey Cal, take a listen to this. I think you might be interested. And Trip, I was interested. The thing he sent me was a podcast from the folks over at The Christian Humanist. And so, thanks you folks. Uh, if you haven't heard for The Christian Humanists, I've got links down below uh, at theimageoffish.com in this posting. Now, what has happened uh, is that it has inspired me. You guys are my inspiration. You are my muses, Christian, Christian Humanist folks. You are my muses. My experience with the emergent conversation has definitely been one of, of fellowship um, without affiliation. I am a member of the Religious Society of Friends, that's what most folks call the Quakers, and I also am a conversant or conversation partner for folks in the emergent uh, conversation. But I'm not part of an emergent church. I'm part of the Rochester Monthly Meeting of the Religious Society of Friends, and that's my home. I am a uh, a member there, and I, that is my affiliation. I don't belong to an emergent church, per se. So one of the ways I think about this is something that Brian McLaren um, talks about sometimes, and I've seen him do it in one of his presentations. He says, imagine a tree like this, and uh, the tree, if you kind of uh, cut it and looked at a cross section of it, in the center would be the heartwood, and then there would be the kind of the, the middle wood, and then the edge is that, that kind of green area and the bark. And that's where the growing and the life happens on the outside edge. And he says, you can kind of think of that as like a pie graph of Christianity. If uh, this half right here, dunk, dunk, then maybe those are Catholics, and then uh, there's some mainline, and then evangelical, and then Eastern Orthodox, or you know, whatever. We can cut the pie lots of ways. He says, at the center of your denominations, there are folks who are really tied into those traditions of the denomination. But as you get to the edge, people who feel maybe on the edge of the tradition, they still identify themselves as, you know, Catholics or mainline or, you know, Quakers or something, but they also feel like they've got something in common with people who are outside of their denominational tradition. So it might be that a Catholic at the outside edge of their tradition and a Presbyterian on the outside edge of their tradition are both near that living edge and find a lot more in common with themselves than sometimes they do with the, the people at the heart of their own tradition. That doesn't mean they should leave their tradition, find everyone else like them, and form a new church. To the degree that that's happening, folks over at the Christian Humanist, I agree. I think that that's um, bad business. Because part of what it seems to me that the emergent conversation is about is finding conversation partners that bring in different perspectives and have some similar perspectives and you gain from learning from each other's backgrounds. As a Quaker, I have all sorts of things that are, are true for me and part of my religious tradition that are not part of anyone else's and vice versa. So I learn a lot and I, I hope that I bring something to the table that uh, other folks wouldn't otherwise hear. But I don't want to leave my tradition for the sake of finding other people who already think like me. That would be counterproductive. So to the fact that people are trying to do that, you know, I, I can't say I would particularly recommend it or give it my thumbs up or seal of approval. I think that part of what the Emergent Conversation does is inviting dialogue and an invitational place for people from different backgrounds to connect. Uh, and to the degree it's doing that, good. Uh, to the degree it's making people uh, leave their homes and connect to other folks so that they can feel more comfortable and like everyone likes them, eh, that might be getting a little squishy for me. The, the folks on the podcast were saying, you know, uh, that's great to be open and interested in dialogue, but at some point in time you got to have a theological stance. And they made this comment, I'm paraphrasing, that if you look at church history, you know, people like Luther and people like Calvin and, you know, part of the creedal stuff in, in Nicene, people came down and even though they might have been open for conversation, at some point in time they said what it was they believed. And what I thought is interesting, and the reflection that my wife made, was that all of the conversation happening in the, the Christian Humanist podcast was about theologians and thinkers. And so, of course, it is the case that over the course of Christian history, those theologians and thinkers would come down and make a, make a commitment and say, this is the theology. It seems to me that part of the thrust of this emerging thought is that the primary goal has to be about living your life in such a way that it reflects Christian values concretely, and that on the edges of that, theology are addressed because theology is part and parcel of how we live our lives. 
And theologians and philosophers for most of Christian history have done that the other way around. They've written some very smart folks in a way that was um, kind of incisive and clear, but they've mostly been focused on theology prior to praxis, actually living it out. And so while I hear you guys saying, uh, the, the Christian humanist guys, you know, uh, I really wish the emergent folks would come down on something, I, I wonder about that because it seems to me from what I've heard uh, that what people are interested in is living out those lives and working out theology as a part of living it. And so that might mean that the, the theology is delayed as you start to get your house in order. Maybe it will be the case that eventually folks who identify as emergent will have theological statements. Um, I'm not sure. And so I don't need to put out my theology for all of you because just because you're emergent, you might be Presbyterian or um, four square uh, gospel or you know any number of other traditions. And so my theology, which is Quaker theology, brings me to the table in conversation with you, but I don't know as if it's necessarily what you want to be bringing back home to the presbytery. And if it is, well, then we'll get there. But I don't think uh, an emergent theology as such is what's called for because we're supposed to be at the table talking to each other, not telling each other what it is that we're supposed to think and believe. And that's just my thought. I don't care what the group is, whether it is a neo-Calvinist or it's an emergent folk or um, more mainline tradition. Exclusion, it seems to me, has too often been part of what the Christian path has been about. You're part of the cool table or not. You're saved or you're not. And the way we know you're saved or we're not is because of our human judgment. Uh, I am not saying everything goes and that everything can be willy-nilly laissez-faire. But too often we have made our human judgment be um, equated to the divine judgment. And I don't think that that's our job or our place. And we don't get anywhere other than exclusion when we do that. So here's just a thought. In the podcast uh, for the Christian Humanists, uh, about minute 45, they started talking about hipness and coolness and how they really had a problem with how cool the emergent church seemed to be. And somewhere along the line, um, this line, down with cool pastors, uh, a pastor should not be allowed to be cool, was said. And I think it was done in jest, so I don't want to take it too seriously. But I think there's an underpinning there that I want to um, tease out a little bit. To the degree that coolness or hipness or you know whatever it is becomes exclusionary, uh, I agree with you guys completely. Stop it. So if if coolness and hipness is that you have to be this hip to come to this church, get out, homo. Let's stop. We don't want to be doing that. But the response that you guys had was just to say down with cool pastors, and we can't have a pastor be cool. Uh, also. Um, rub me the wrong way. It's possible. Now, if people are performing to try and make their church cool because that's how they are and they want their church to be cool because it's one of these exclusive churches that you have to be cool to be in, I do have a problem with cool pastors. But I think it's possible, um, maybe not likely, but it's possible that there are people out there who, who are hip. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. So my emphasis wouldn't be against cool pastors or against cool churches. It would be against people who are building artificial walls where the kingdom of God wants us to be united, like you said, uh, you know, with no Jew or Gentile or master or slave. So I don't like building up these us, them kinds of things. And I do it too. I absolutely do it too. And it, it's part of my fail, fallibility as a human. But I think to the degree that we can say, you know, coolness isn't the problem, exclusionary coolness is, I would feel much more comfortable with that. I tend to think of emergent thought as a toolkit, not a home. My home is in the religious society of friends right now, and that's, that's where home is. But emerging thought, process thought, um, you know, this postmodern way of dealing and thinking in, about the world, that is a toolkit for me. It helps me understand myself in a way that seems beneficial, and so I make use of it. But my home is in my religious tradition, and emerging thought is a tool that I use to help me um, fill out my home with ideas and things and thoughts and friends um, that I might not otherwise have found. So that's my two cents. I'd be interested in hearing any comments about any piece of this, and uh, I hope you guys have a good Thanksgiving if you practice eating turkey.